After such a lavish introduction as that, I can't wait to hear the message this morning. Would you turn in your Bible, please, to Psalm 32. Psalm 32, which is the Old Testament equivalent, I guess, to 1 John 1, 9. And that is, it's a psalm of victory. You notice the, the very first word of it is the word blessed. It's a word that never applies to God. It always applies, and it applies at all, speaking about people. In this case, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. The word blessed, I looked that one up, quite a word. It's the word that describes you when you can walk along confidently, head high. That's the word happy, I guess except that happy is too close to the word lucky, which I trust we reject, but happy is the man. Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man, the son of Adam, unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile, in whose spirit there is no trickery, no bait and switch. He promises one thing and then pays off with something different and less, you can figure, or more expensive. Uh, there may be those here who have, in a manner, given up. And as that song goes, take the world and give me Jesus, you've decided that for now you might just as well reverse that and take the world. But uh, then, for any of you who may find yourself in that case, all I can say is you've been warned, and there's a reality out there that I invite you to take a hard look at, because the way of the transgressor is hard, and you do well to walk with the Lord. You knew that down in your bone marrow someplace, but uh, for any who are tempted to go that route, you might as well have your fun, your pleasure now, when you do not know what's down the road, so you better enjoy it. I urge you, watch out. But then, for those of you who are living in guilt or living in dread, you know, are your sins really gone are they really under the blood? What about the ones you haven't committed yet? Are you in real danger? Uh, does the Christian have to live that way? And you notice that the way David puts it here, there's such a thing as victory. There's such a thing as joy for the sinner. And it is that that I would like to, like to focus on this morning in these next few moments that I have. And that is that God bids us Walk not in gloom, nor in defeat. You don't go around with your head down all the time. There is such a thing as walking in victory and walking in joy. And somebody says, in other, in other words, you're saying we get to sinless perfection? Ah, don't we wish? No, we can clear our minds of that one. Uh, our sins doth ever beset us. And uh, we're ever in danger. As I heard a conductor say one time, talking about soloists, as a musician, as a soloist, you're no better than the last note you've sung. And as a saint, you're no better than the last word you uttered or the last deed you did. So when it comes to sinless perfection, I trust that every one of us has victory over that notion, and we get there only when Christ comes for us. But in the meantime, there's such a thing as walking in, in victory and not walking in defeat, and it is that to which I invite all of us, and that is, we should walk in victory. And David here is going to give us some indication as to how to do it. And I trust you're going to follow as I read now verse 3. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring, my wailing, my groaning all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me, and my moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin unto thee, mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Now, you notice how verses 3, 4, and 5 go together. And that is that the first step of victory is when we admit to God what we did. That is to say, by dealing with sin. Terrible thing to live with guilt. I suppose every one of us has endured enough of that Agony, that uh, you can sympathize with what I just said. It is a terrible thing to live with guilt, and it is a wonderful thing to be free from it. I had a girl that used to stay in our home, and a dear girl was taking four and five showers a day. I thought, well, I guess I can sacrifice 
or hot water and a good cause. But she had lived such a rotten life that I think that all those showers were just a, an attempt to try to feel clean when the Lord could have taken, it, taken care of it, I think, in a better way. But here the psalmist says, My bones waxed old through my roaring. My bones, bones waxed old all the day long. It's as though his, his very uh, bones were crumbling and he was giving way to osteoporosis or something. Verse 4, Day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. That produces depression, you know. And then the rest of the verse, My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. If there's anything that will dry you out, and especially dry out your mouth, it's fear, it's dread. And David had experienced this often enough in his lifetime. And as he goes over this, then finally he gets to the solution. And that is, verse 5, I acknowledged my sin unto thee. That is to say, he told God what he did. My iniquity have I not hid. That word hidden is the same word that you have in Proverbs, same root word, same word you have in Proverbs 28, I believe it's verse 13, when it says, He who covereth his sin shall not prosper, but he that confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Now, I trust that that is a spiritual principle you've picked up long ago. And that is, you've done something, you're ashamed of it, you hope nobody finds out about it, you cover it any way you can. It doesn't work, does it? Even if you get rich. There's still a spiritual poverty, worse than poverty, you have to go with. And so, when the writer of Proverbs wrote, He who covereth his sin shall not prosper. He wasn't kidding. And that's the word that you have here in the second line of verse 5. <clears throat> My iniquity have I not covered. I have not tried to hide it any longer. And then the third uh, the line here says, I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And so you want relief? I trust you do. I trust you know it. It's like to live in guilt. And the, stir, the step, the first step out of it is when you simply and frankly tell God what you did. You notice he says, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. You don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to justify yourself. You don't have to explain yourself. Every one of you knows that expression. Look, Dad, I can explain everything. Well, look, Lord, I don't have to explain everything. You can't explain it. There's no use trying to punish yourself. There's no try use trying to cover it. Now, I suppose if there's anything that will go on that list, it's restitution. And if you've stolen something, you've taken what doesn't belong to you, then in that case, you've got to pay it back or give it back. Uh, when you've confessed your sin, you don't get to keep the money. So that is one thing that I think you need to add to the list. And that is, you confess your sin to the Lord, you tell Him what you've done, and you trust Him then to walk away in peace, because that's the one requirement He puts on you. You don't have to say you're sorry, although I guess that's all right. You don't have to apologize to the Lord, although... If you'd apologize to another person, I guess you'd apologize to the Lord. But he doesn't ask you notice for an apology. He doesn't ask for a lot of prayer. He says, just tell me what you did. And if you don't think, there's, think that's difficult, just try it. When you have to frame in words the offense that you've committed. And then you notice against whom it's committed. Now here's a point that I believe needs to be cleared up and needs to be stressed. And that is, he confesses his sin to the Lord. And will you hang on to this little dictum? The sphere of offense determines the sphere of confession. Now let me say that again because I believe it's terribly important. The sphere of offense determines the sphere of confession. That is to say, if I have sinned against the whole school in some way, I don't just confess it to the Lord and maybe to one other person. If I've sinned against the whole school, I owe it to everybody to tell what I've done and, and try to make it right. On the other hand, if I've sinned against just one or two of you, it's not my place to go to the whole class and blab it in front of them. You get what I'm saying? The sphere of offense determines the sphere of confession. When David had sinned in the matter of Bathsheba, oh man, oh, how many people found out about that? And yet, when he's writing Psalm 51, un strangely, Uncannily, he says, against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Well, what about Uriah the Hittite? And I guess it's only because 
in the presence of God, the guilt before God is so vastly greater even than the offenses that he con committed against his nation, against his people. And so I say that to you very carefully. I remember in another school I taught once, uh, some guys got together in a dorm one night and somebody came up with this slogan, absolute honesty. And in this dorm room, they're going to be absolutely honest with one another and they're going to tell it all. Now, absolute honesty, fine. But absolute disclosure is not required. The only place in the Bible where you're commanded to con confess your faults one to another is in a sick room where you've got a small group of older men, you've got somebody lying there sick, <clears throat> they anoint them with oil, they confess around. So here for a moment, you've got a room where there's no unconfessed sin, and then they pray over him, and he'll probably get better. No guarantee, but he'll probably get better. And the Lord will raise him up. Don't expect a miracle leaping off the bed, you know, but it will probably get better. But that's the only case I can find in the whole Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, in which anybody is commanded to confess his sins before other people. Now, as I say, if I've hurt you, then I owe it to you to make it right. But uh, in that dorm room, may I say, one fellow came out wondering whether he should commit suicide or whether he should commit murder. He was ready to buy a Saturday night special in either case, and then on sober second thought, decided against it. But, I mean, when people are in a situation like that, how easy it is to say too much and things that the Lord never commanded them to say. And that's why I say to you, uh, if somebody gets an idea in a dorm room some night that you're going to really get right with God and confess it all, just remember, the sphere of offense determines the sphere of confession. And if you've hurt all those people in that room, then, okay, go ahead and confess to them. But if not... Private sins, private confession to the Lord alone. Personal sins, only to the person you offended and to the Lord alone. And uh, I trust that you'll keep that principle. I've been around for a while. Some of you have been around for a while. You've been in enough situations that you notice that not just Scripture, but experience bears out the, uh, the necessity of observing that principle. Got it? And therefore... Verse 5, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sins. Now, there's one other concern that I see in verse 5, and that is, what if I fail to remember all the sins that I've committed? Are those still on my record, and I expect punishment or even purgatory or something like that when I have finally to face the Lord and hear all these sins that I didn't even know about or I wasn't aware of or didn't understand or just forgot about and I haven't confessed them. Anybody, don't raise a hand. Anybody worried about that one? And may I give you this word? And that is in Psalm 19, verse 12. David asked this question, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. And David had enough faith to realize that God in his mercy, God in his glory, understands, knows all about us, our weakness, our frailty, our poor memory. And if you remember a sin you've committed, then get right to him. Keep short accounts. Make it right. Get there now, you know. But what about those you've forgotten or don't, didn't, didn't even realize they were sins? Aren't you grateful that God is merciful and gracious and slow to anger? and plenteous in mercy. So, we rest on Him. Because you notice that last verse, line of verse 5, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. So that's the, that leads to the second step of victory, and that is trusting His forgiveness. He's promised to do it, but can you really believe that? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness to cleanse us from all the hurts we've inflicted on other people. Can you really believe that? Say, well, I guess I've got to. I had to believe John 3.16. That's why I'm here. And there's some other verses I've had to believe and claim. And you have to claim this one. When he promised to forgive you, he's a gentleman. He does not go back on his word. He does not offer one thing and then do something... Well, maybe I better pause on that one. We pray, if it be thy will... And you think of the things we pray for, the things that God seemed to promise. And if he had granted those promises, we'd be in bad case. So, when I say God is honest, God is a gentleman, he deals in grace, 
He gives us what truly is best for us, even if we don't see it at the time, because give us a couple of years down the road and we'll look back and say, He hath done all things well. But in the meantime, you claim His forgiveness. He promised to do it. He will do it. And therefore, if you're going to claim His forgiveness, what that begins to mean anyway is to think it through. The other day in Hebrews class, we got to Hebrews 4.11, where it says, a labor to enter into that rest. Now, that seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? Work hard so you'll enter into... Well, maybe not. Work hard all week and Saturday or Sunday you can take it easy. Labor to enter into that rest. But the word labor is not talking about work in this case. It's more like the word aspire or attempt or spend yourself. And I believe what... And the writer of Hebrews is talking about is pretty much the same thing you have here. And that is it's a mental effort. It's not easy to think. Remember, of course, I was teaching one time, this, not here. This girl came to me and she says, look, I got a 4.0 average going. Don't make me think. Just tell me what I need to memorize. And she was exasperated. You know. Okay, that's your ideal of education. Surely not. Don't make me think. Just tell me what to memorize. Well, in this case, I haven't got anything right now for you to memorize. You're going to have to think. And that is, as you think of these verses and think of these promises and then think of the rest, the serenity of the soul that God has for you when you have really claimed the forgiveness and claimed the mercy of God and you've contemplated Calvary and you've thought about the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ and what it cost Him to buy your salvation. And as you turn these things over in your mind, and then you're thinking, here I am, a guilty sinner. I'm bent to sin. I don't know from one moment to the next what I'm going to do to hurt the Lord's feelings. And then to think that He has asked you and bid you to enter into a state of serenity in which you're no longer living in fear, no longer living in dread, no longer living in guilt, but simply resting on Christ. And you need a kind of mental effort. Talk about intellect, no. But anyway, a mental effort to get your mind around that wonderful truth. And that is that God bids you to enter into rest. I'll use the word victory because it's pretty nearly the same thing. Because once you have thought your way through that, then you get to another verse. Philippians 3.13. And I don't even quote the whole verse. Just that one line, that one phrase of it. Forgetting those things which are behind. Now, God has a very good forgetter, I heard Pastor say one time. And that is, when you've committed sin and you've confessed those sins and God has forgiven you, it says then that as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed your transgressions from you. There's a north pole and a south pole. And if you go through the middle of the earth, they're 8,000 miles apart. And if you go around the edge, it's about 12,000 miles apart from the North Pole to the South Pole. But did you ever see the East Pole? West Pole? Say, there aren't, there aren't any. Exactly. As far as the East is from the West. Not as far as the North is from the South. As far as the East is from the West. An infinite distance. So far as He removed our transgressions from us. And if He's removed them that far, and if He has forgotten them, you say, no, 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 no. God's eternal. God knows all things. Well, He has voluntarily chosen to forget our sins. He's dropped them into the depths of the sea. Deepest place is, what, 37,000 feet or so? A long way. Hard to get there. Our deep sea vehicles, can't find them down there. God has forgotten. God has forgiven. And therefore, by another mental effort, when there are things you regret, things you wish you could get away from, things you wish you could do, you simply trust that God has done that. Trust that God has forgiven you. I remember a fellow I went to seminary with years ago. And his life verse was, if you only knew what I did. And I've heard that from his lips several times. I don't know how many. It might have been three. It might have been twelve. But I think every student with him was either said or inclined to say, Ralph, we don't want to hear your dreary sins. Can't you simply trust God that they're gone? Oh, but if you only knew what I did. Well, I trust that he's long since over that. But if any of you are thinking of that, that thing that just knots your stomach, if 
only you hadn't done it. If only, you know. Can you forget those things which are behind and reach forward unto those things which are before and press toward the mark for the upward calling, the rapture, the upward calling or resurrection of God in Christ Jesus. And therefore, you see, you confess to God, you tell Him what you did, trust Him for forgiveness, but then I think a couple more verses here that I'd like to draw your attention to. Verse 10. I'm, le- I'm skipping gold, but you'll forgive me for that. Verse 10. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked. Yeah. But he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Now take a look at that line. He that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall hem him in on all sides. Shall beset him. Every direction you look. When you're trusting in the Lord, you're looking at the mercy of God. And the word for mercy here, you check that one out. And probably the basic meaning of it is, man, what a word. The word is to, admi- to desire ardently that God has mercy on you, this word. And it comes up all the way through the Psalms, all the way through the, the Old Testament. is the word hesed, meaning ardently desire or the ardent desire. And that is when you are trusting in the Lord, God's ardent desire for you, his desire for your response, his desire for your holiness, all of those things. He has this ardent desire for you and it, it, it's just surrounding you, all sides. What a state for a believer to be in, you know. You know, I think of that word happy at the beginning of this, of this blessed psalm. And a dictum that I trust, at least some of you or maybe all of you have picked up, and that is God is not concerned about our happiness. He's concerned about our holiness. And you wonder, why do I go through trials? And why does God put me through griefs and problems and bereavements and sickness, accident? Why does God put me through all this stuff? And then the answer is that God is, I guess, in a way concerned about our happiness, but he's really concerned about our holiness. And he's leading us to, leading us to holiness and the image of Christ. And then you look at this psalm. And here, it's like two railroad rails. And here you got this one and you got that one. And they don't seem to meet, but you look down the tracks and they meet. Because in this psalm, you notice happiness and holiness meet. They go together. And that is when you have come to this moment when you've told God the past and he has forgiven you and you've claimed that forgiveness, God pronounces you not just holy, but he, cannot, he pronounces you happy, pronounces you blessed. What a combination. Eh? Okay, now, verse, thir- uh, verse 11. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. Now, this describes the person who's right with God. I don't care how bad, how rotten your past, but it describes the person who is right with God. And you notice the first word that he uses is be glad. And what I see here is, you've confessed your sin, you have claimed God's forgiveness and believed him for what he did, but now, I think it's a step further, you claim the joy. And it can be done. Now, to claim the joy, I got one recommendation, and that comes out of Romans... Well, you remember the end of seven. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then the next words are, I thank God. And as I've suggested in Romans class and maybe some other occasions, it is when you give up struggling, you're exhausted, you're spent in utter despair, you've hit the concrete. Then you say, Lord, thank you anyway. I'll never be any good. I never was. I never will be. I've given up, Lord. I've hit the bottom. But, Lord, I thank you that you've saved me. I thank you that you love me somehow. You know? And when you start thanking God, you're out of chapter 7 and all that misery and defeat. Then you're into chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Now here, how do you get verse 11 to be glad in the Lord? And is it not as we spend ourselves to thank him for what he's done for us? To thank him that he saved us anyway, no matter what we are? To thank him that Christ did indeed die for us? To thank him that he's got his hand on us and we haven't been able to get out from under it yet? In fact, some of you got thumbprints in your neck yet from the hand of God gripping you. You know? And therefore, as we thank God and turn our gaze to him, 
He has a way then of giving us, verse 11, being glad in the Lord. He has a way of enabling us to rejoice. In fact, that word rejoice can be translated to jump for joy. We can come to that experience in the Christian life as we step by step go through this psalm and claim the victory so that life does not have to be a series of defeats, a continuing kind of wretchedness as we think of those awful sins we've committed, but oh, thank God, Jesus died for them anyway. Well, there is that moment, psychologically, there is that moment in Christian experience but God wants you to get way beyond it. I remember, I was talking with a fellow one time, I'm not sure he stayed off drugs, but when I was talking with him, he'd been clean for a while. And he was telling me about a girl, I think she was still in the high school he'd been to. And she'd been not only heavy on drugs, but she'd, she'd pushed drugs, persuaded a lot of young people to start buying from her. And then she was saved. And he said she was really saved. I mean, there's no question about it. And she's walking with God. And he said, this may sound bad, sound terrible, but he said, I heard her make this statement. You know, I suppose I should feel regret for all the things I did. The drugs I pushed, the people I hurt, the people that I got hooked on drugs. But somehow, I can't live in dread and I can't live in fear. God has saved me. God has delivered me from my past. And here she was in joy. And you know, you think of that. For a moment, you think, that, that's too easy. Well, it looks too easy. But can we not at least work some sympathy for a girl who had come to that position? And that is that God had so given her victory that she could now walk in joy, free from that wretched past, and walk in joy. I suppose if there's any footnote I would put on that one. I remember when my wife, bless her heart, was dean of women. She lasted for seven years. That's all she could take. But anyhow... Uh, she had one of many tragedies, one when this girl was supposed to be the bed check Charlie, make sure that all the girls in her part of the dorm were in bed and had the lights out, and then lights were out. She'd slip out the back door, meet her boyfriend out there, and drive off. One night they were in this motel, and just settling down into each other's arms when there was an argument outside, and bam, bam, bam! A murder committed, you know, right outside the room. That kind of jars your emotions. Anyway, that's aside from the point. Uh, the couple were finally smoked out. And uh, after denying it in the president's office for an hour, an hour and a half, finally, yeah, it's, it's true. One, one after, then the other. And my wife had been so close to this girl, at least she thought she was, for a couple of years there. And then to have this happen... I can remember her praying. Now, Lord, don't let her off too quickly. Don't let her off, Lord, until she realizes the enormity of what she has be done, and be done in betraying her testimony, betraying the school. Then, Lord, let her have the peace, but no, don't let it come too quickly until she realizes. Well, can you sympathize with that prayer or was my wife out of bounds? I don't think she was. There is such a thing, there's such a spiritual carelessness in this Laodicean generation that we take sin pretty casually. But uh, I think she was right in praying it. And I think the end of her prayer was right too. Then, Lord, bring her out into victory. And she did come into victory. And God she never came back to school, although we'd have taken her back eventually if she'd wanted to come. But God, I believe, did give her victory. Happy married life, children, usefulness. But I believe the first part of that prayer was also answered. Not until she had realized the enormity of what she had done. And then, until God had really given her a sense of forgiveness. Am I talking your language? Am I, being, am I showing where David is and where you are? And that's why I say, for anybody living carelessly, watch it. You've been warned. But for those of you, any of you who are living in guilt and in dread... What can happen the next time I sin? You know? Can you claim the promise? First of all, as you keep short accounts with God and tell Him what you did, He'll forgive you. And then, not only will He forgive you, but then it's kind of up to you to claim that forgiveness and trust Him and believe His promises. And then having done that, 
then really to lay hold of God in believing prayer, that you have such a full sense of forgiveness, that the joy comes and the gladness comes to the place where you can jump for joy at God's wonderful desire for you and God's wonderful mercy on you and God's wonderful care over your life from here on out. Now shall we pray? Father, oh Father, we thank Thee that these words are from Thee. And Lord, how we pray that Thou would fulfill them. We ask, Lord God, the blessedness, the joy, the, the rest that Thou hast promised. And I pray, Lord, that it might be true of everyone in this room. But, oh Father, that we might never take sin casually. And Lord, that we might never take it in despair. But I pray, Father, that Thou would work in power that we might truly be known for thy joy, for thy victory. And I pray, Lord, that every one of us might walk, not in self-congratulation, but, Lord, surely that every one of us might walk in victory. We trust thee, therefore, Lord, for thy care. Guide us through this day. Oh, Father, we thank thee. Trust thee for thy mercies. That's thy blessing and thy mercy upon our school indeed. And, Lord, we thank thee in Jesus' name. Amen.